Hi, this is Dr. Kat Fies from Central New Mexico Community College. There are many, many more videos to come on the respiratory system, but they will focus on respiratory physiology. This video, video G, focuses on the very last bit of respiratory anatomy, namely the lungs themselves, with the pleura, the pleural uh, cirrhosis. One of the things we notice right away when we look at pictures of our lungs or we see actual lungs in a human being is that the left lung is shaped differently and it even has less lobes. And that's of course to make room for the heart. So this indentation in the left lung we refer to as the cardiac notch. The right lung has three lobes and remember each one of these lobes is going to receive its own bronchus while the right I'm mean, sorry the left lobe the left lung has only two lobes with the more superior lobe being quite large each one of these lobes is made of of small segments you can barely barely see these thin faded lines in the background those are the segments also fed with um, segmental bronchi and eventually each segment is made up of little lobules and they are served by bronchioles. And by the way, the entry point here for the left and the right bronchus and also major blood vessels and nerve vessels, um, those, those areas here where we see these entry points for all of these different vessels and tubes will refer to as the hilus of each lung. So you're going to see this term popping up. It's a term actually used for regions of organs that receive many vessels or ducts. Uh, for, it's a term used for many organs, not just for the lungs, by the way. So we need to talk blood supply to our lungs because so far you've familiarized yourself quite a bit by now uh, with the pulmonary circulation, right, which means that blood is pumped by the right ventricle into the pulmonary trunk. The pulmonary trunk carries this oxygen-poor blood, right, oxygen-poor blood uh, into the pulmonary arteries and eventually by means of gas exchange between the capillaries and the lungs and the alveoli, we now have oxygen-rich blood returning via the pulmonary veins to the heart, more specifically to the left atrium of the heart, right? You know all that. But don't forget, just like the heart needs to have um, blood that nourishes the heart itself, that is your coronary vessels, we need to have something like that for the lungs as well. And we refer to that as the bronchial circulation of the lungs. And it consists of bronchial arteries and bronchial veins. Just like the left and right coronary artery that feed the heart uh, arise from the aorta, we see that our bronchial arteries also arise from the aorta and enter the lungs at the hilus. These bronchial arteries are going to be carrying oxygen-rich blood because, after all, they arise from the aorta. The bronchial veins, on the other hand, they are going to be oxygen-poor. And notice, interestingly enough, they're going to anastomose with the pulmonary veins. And what do you know about the pulmonary veins? The pulmonary veins are actually oxygen-rich. So there's a little bit of mixing of the blood going on between oxygen-rich and oxygen-poor blood. Just like our heart, our lungs are characterized by dual innervation. And remember, that means innervation by both the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system. Recall that your parasympathetic nervous system secretes acetylcholine and your sympathetic fibers, they are going to secrete, secrete norepinephrine. And um, in the event the sympathetic nervous system as a whole were activated, then the adrenal gland would also add epinephrine. 
let's think through what these different neurotransmitters cause in the bronchial tree. And you notice that we're going to be using terminology such as bronchoconstriction and bronchodilation analogously to vasoconstriction and vasodilation. When we learned about the sympathetic innervation of our blood vessels and only sympathetic innervation, no parasympathetic innervation of blood vessels, we learned that norepinephrine acted as a vasoconstrictor, right? Notice here that norepinephrine is going to function as a bronchodilator. Now, how can you remember this? How can you logically remember this? Well, think of a person with an asthma attack. Maybe you suffer from asthma. We are going to provide that person with adrenaline or noradrenaline, which is the same thing as norepinephrine and epinephrine, because we know that that chemical, that kind of a hormone, that kind of a neurotransmitter will actually relax the smooth muscle of our bronchioles and cause dilation. So always try to remember, of, think of that scenario. What do we provide a patient with an asthma attack? And therefore deduce from that that the sympathetic nervous system is going to promote bronchodilation, while your parasympathetic nervous system is going to trigger bronchoconstriction. The nerves that enter these, the, the hilus area of each one of the lungs form this network, which we'll refer to as the pulmonary plexus. Now, the last thing we need to do is take a closer look at the serous membranes that surround our lungs. And you learned about these in, in Anatomy and Physiology Part 1, but let's do a quick review and make sure you really have these clear in your minds. Remember, the serous membranes of the lungs we refer to as the pluri, and singular, that would be pleura. We refer to that pleura that touches our viscera, which is our lung, directly as the visceral pleura. So the visceral pleura touches the lung tissue itself. We're going to then have, uh, you know, a minute amount of space that is filled with serous fluid, which is a very watery, watery fluid that we find in all of the um, cavities formed by serous membranes throughout the ventral body cavity. Um, so we then have the pleural cavity, and then we finally get to our parietal layer, or better referred to as the parietal pleura, illustrated note right here. So the parietal pleura presses up against uh, things such as the, the rib cage and the muscles that are found in between our ribs, better referred to the internal and external intercostals. Our lungs, by the way, are also going to rest somewhat on top of the diaphragm our most important inspiratory skeletal muscle. To better be able to visualize these different pleura, or pluri, I should say, let's use this cross-section of our um, thoracic cavity. So here on the posterior side, we see our vertebra. Here's our spinous process of the thoracic vertebra. And here we see our sternum, just to make sure that you understand that this portion uh, or this side is going to be anterior and this side is going to be posterior on the diagram. Um, I'm going to use two different colors to illustrate the pleury. We'll start with yellow to represent the visceral pleura. And so if I try to trace that, by the way, they give them these pluri on this old picture, a, a slightly different term. For instance, notice they call it the pulmonary pleura for the visceral. So I'm following this. Well, first, we'll just start there where it's labeled, like so. Let's stop there for a moment where the hilus is and continue down this way. Notice that this visceral pleura actually goes into the fissures that separate the different lobes. Now, remember that these, these pluri, even though they get different names, visceral versus parietal, 
if we could take him out of the body and, and lay him out on a table, it would be one membrane, right? You learned about that in AMP1. And so that's why we see here um, at the level of the hyalus of the lung, and now I'm switching to green to illustrate the parietal pleura. The parietal pleura starts to form as we fold over the visceral pleura, and here we see the parietal pleura pressing up against the ribs, the diaphragm, etc. And it even follows the heart a little bit. There we go. This video is the last video in a series of videos on the respiratory anatomy. The future videos that will follow are going to focus on respiratory physiology.